Well, hello everyone. Alexis Brooks here from Higher Journeys, back with yet another episode of Conscious Commentary. You know what I like to say next. I hope you all are doing well wherever you may be on this little blue planet. I know in this part of this little blue planet, I'm pretty happy because it is finally spring. We're about, oh, less than a weekend. And I'm starting to feel it. It's feeling good. The sun's high in the sky. Green is starting to pop up out of the ground. Birds are starting to chirp. All those typical signs, all those things that happen so naturally with nature when the seasons change. So it's spring. Speaking of that, I'm going to make this a segue. The things that happen naturally. How about our psychic ability? How about that? Is that natural for you? I tend to believe, and this is what we're going to be talking about today, that we all have at least a tinge of psychic ability, maybe more. I believe that it is innate within all of us, but somehow it has gone dormant. It's become atrophied. And so I do feel that there are things that we can do to wake up that psychic muscle. And that's what this is about. Tips to awaken and strengthen your psychic muscle. Let me tell you the inspiration for uh, for, for how this came about very quickly. I was at an event uh, about a week ago, a, f- a little fundraiser that a friend of mine had uh, done for her nonprofit, and she had a psychic on hand as part of the part of the fun and part of the fundraiser. And I just had to chuckle as I watched people line up. Could not wait to get a reading. Had to get a reading. I never even saw this woman. I had no interest in getting a reading, <laughs> but I, I I ran the other way. Actually, I didn't run. I was sitting and talking to people, but just kind of watching the flow. People could not wait to get in there and have uh, their readings done. And I thought to myself, hmm, I've never been one to go to uh, to psychics. I've obviously had some on the show. I do believe there is a phenomenon. We know that. And I do feel that we all have a bit of it. And I also feel that we can develop it on our own. Sure, there are times where it's difficult to get out of our own way. And perhaps uh, uh, on occasion, we may want to consult with others. But we have so many tools built within us why not develop them? So I thought it would be fun to give you a few tips. And I'm going to run through them. We're not going to go too long today. Uh, things, that, Some things that I've done on my own, some that I'm just learning about. But uh, without further ado, let's get into uh, one of them. This is something that I've talked about before. In fact, I think I mentioned it briefly last week, uh, or two weeks ago, when we did a special on Mercury retrograde, and how I did not need to know or read that, hey, it's Mercury retrograde. I could feel it. I could sense it. Now, obviously, you've got the typical hallmarks of technology breaking down, communications breaking down, etc. But it felt that way. I can't really put my finger on uh, or, or describe what that feeling is other than a little bit of a off kilter, a sense of feeling off kilter or out of out of alignment. And so as per usual, once I get a sense, I say, hey, yeah, it's Mercury retrograde. Lo and behold, there it is. So I guess the only point I want to make here in terms of an actual exercise, or really a commitment that one can make with oneself to rather than look up when it's a full moon, a new moon or a retrograde, or even time of day, start to monitor your feelings, your sense, even your skin. I, I love I talked to Steve Mara, a great um, Uh, researcher out of the UK, you've heard me talk about, and how he talks about how the skin can really act as a a sensing device for for certain scenarios, particularly fight or flight. If there's if you're in a situation that may may be um, hazardous to you, (laughs) you can feel it with your skin, the tingling of the skin. Uh, But I, I do feel that we can use even our extra senses to, to to feel into planetary positions. So that's something that I would absolutely recommend. See if you can start to delineate whether it's a full moon, a new moon, a retrograde, or even, like I said, the time of day. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about that. We may come back to that later, but let me move on to something else. There are several tips that I would like to share, and this is one of them. This is something else. This is something that I have not done, but recently read about in a book that's been on my shelf for years, 
called Psychic Breakthroughs Today by uh, the late parapsychologist D. Scott Rogo. This book was uh, written back in 1987. He unfortunately died in uh, 1990 at age 40, but uh, had previously done some amazing work and breakthroughs himself in really getting into the science of uh, the field of parapsychology. He talks about an experiment that was conducted, uh, I think, back in the 70s. I I was going to read from the book, but I think I can pretty much relay it to you as, as I recall, in which he used a combination, he took a subject and had guided the subject through sort of an imagery experiment where the subject was to recall a possible dream that they had had, or even imagine a scenario of getting up out of bed, walking to the closet and into the closet. And on the other side of the closet was a meadow. Now, uh, the the person conducting the experiment was guiding the subject through this entire process. Walking through the meadow, and the meadow is described, I would imagine, as a normal meadow would be. There's grassy knolls, and there's flowers, and the sky is blue, and there's clouds, etc. However, at the end of the meadow, at the top of the hill, I believe he said, there's something there that is out of context that you would no- not normally find in a meadow. He obviously did not tell the subject what it was, but instead had another individual, I think he called an agent, pull a picture out of an envelope and stare at it. And then ask, now this person, this agent that had the image in his hand was in another room, asked the subject to tell him what he saw at the end of the meadow to see if what he saw matched the image on the piece of paper. And lo and behold, it was accurate. Now, interestingly, uh, it said that this this experiment could not be replicated for whatever reason, but I still found it to be interesting because what it said to me is we can use imagination, we can use imagery, whether self-guided or guided by someone else, fuse it with something that actually exists, in this case, a piece of paper with, a, with an, uh, an image or a drawing on it, an item on it, and procure that information based on uh, the the imagination. Do you see what I'm saying? I've always been a big proponent of imagination and improvisation on our own. I talked about this recently with Daryl Anka uh, in our show that we did about a, a week or so ago in Los Angeles. So somehow imagination and the more uh, detailed that imagination becomes, the more we may be opening up the right brain to be able to procure information that actually does exist. So this is something that you might play with as a a way of strengthening the receiving channel. When we say psychic, we're really talking about the receiver. I believe that we are sender, receiver, transmitters. When we're talking about psychic ability, we're talking about reception, receiving. Receiving from what? The field, the field of infinite information. But that's another story for another time. I want to stick with the tips. Very, very interesting stuff. Now, I want to talk about another uh, little, this wasn't an experiment per se, but something that I've noticed uh, that I do, perhaps you do as well. And I'm going to call this spontaneous messaging. Spontaneous messaging. Let me tell you what this is based on. Something that happened to me about a week, maybe two, maybe even three weeks ago. I was talking to an individual who I've recently gotten to know who has begun channeling. She has started the process of channeling herself. She did not, I don't believe, uh, set out to do this, but found herself in a position where she was bringing through messages from another, an entity. Okay, but that's that aside. We were sitting down having a conversation and she was, you know, saying, saying to me, Alexis, you know, I'm really trying to understand this dynamic of what I've been doing, who or what am I bringing through? Really just, you know, at a, at a stage of pure curiosity, wanting to understand the process of channeling, but also who she's bringing through. And I got to tell you guys, immediately I got this sense, a thrust is how I described it, a push to say to her, more than one is what I said. She said, what? I said, you're bringing through more than one more than one entity, more than one voice. She stopped. She said, no, 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 I don't, I don't think so. I said again, with 
almost a sense of urgency. You are bringing through more than one. I said, when this happens this way, and I explained to her when I get this out of the blue, I'll get this, you know, you got to say this and you've got to say it this way. Uh, I told her this is, you know, this is what's coming through. She says, she stopped for a minute and she said, oh my gosh, you may be right. She said, the last time I channeled, I referred to, or the channel, not the channel, but the entity referred to itself as we. Oh my gosh. We both looked at each other and kind of high five, like, hey, I think I brought something through. Spontaneous messaging. Does that happen to you? This is not something that I try to do. It's just something that, that kind of comes through. But the bottom line is, how might you distinguish something that's coming through your conscious self, most likely the left brain versus something that's coming through you. And this is something that I have learned to, although, like I said, I do, do not do this all the time. It is very spontaneous, i.e. Or, or ergo spontaneous messaging. But when I do, I have discovered that there are certain attributes. Uh, the tone of my voice might change slightly. The urgency and what I'm saying specifically will come through. I will feel a push to say it. And so I've started to sort of mentally document these uh, aspects that happen when I think I'm bringing through a message. And so I would suggest to you, because again, here, here again, I'm procuring information from somewhere or somewhere else. <laughs> uh, take note, if this happens to you, take note of the sensations that you're feeling when this comes through so that you can delineate, is this coming through me? Is this something that I'm just wanting to say? Or is it coming from a larger repository of, of information? So that's something else that I think might help. And again, all of these things take practice, guys. I know we all have this ability and it can be strengthened if we consciously practice. Let me move on to another one. I'm going to watch this time because I know I always go over, but I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Let's talk about another one. This is a fun one. This is a, a, another experiment that I recently tried with a friend of mine. I actually just talked about it uh, when I was interviewed on Barry Eaton's uh, radio program out of Australia a couple of weeks ago. A dowsing experiment. I love to pendulum dows. I've been doing it for years on and off. And recently I've kind of picked it up again. It's yet another uh, incredible tool that can be used to to procure information uh, using our own bodies and our own really nerve endings, I think. It's not the, the pendulum that's doing the work. It is simply the conduit. Really, we're the conduit. But coming through us into the pendulum and expressing itself as uh, one motion uh, denoting an answer another motion denoting another answer. Typically, when you have a clockwise motion, typically, I think everyone can be a little bit different. But for me, when I'm asking a question, and they're they are always yes or no, when I'm asking questions, clockwise denotes yes, counterclockwise denotes no, and oscillation, and there's varieties of oscillating uh, movement, can typically for me denote I'm not sure. I don't know or not decided yet. Well, here's the experiment that I tried uh, with a dear friend of mine. She, she's also sort of picked up dowsing. It's kind of fun. Uh, and here's the thing that I would stress. When you're dowsing for answers, I know it's tempting to douse some of very profound things that are very important to you, but particularly when you're practicing, try to keep it to things that are you're somewhat indifferent about. So what we decided to do is we made up a series of questions, each of us, and rather than asking the question to us, meaning, you know, uh, asking something that would be for the purpose of you and then dowsing it yourself, we would ask each other questions. For instance, I would tell her, I want you to ask, did I go to the dentist this week? Meaning me, did I go to the dentist this week? And then she, and of course, I wouldn't tell her the answer. And then she would douse, did Alexis go to the dentist this week? Yes or no? Did my cousin just get a new job? She would douse. Did Alexis's cousin just get a new job? And so on. And see what whether, now obviously she does not know the answer. It could be 
Yes or no? No leading questions here. Well, I have to tell you, every single time, and we, we did it both ways, both, uh, I think I asked her five questions or so, and then she asked me five questions, and I would douse the answer. And each time we were correct, spot on. This is a great little exercise, not only to uh, uh, practice your dowsing, if, if, if that's what you'd like to do, but I do think that as well helps to strengthen the psychic muscle because what we're doing is relying more intently on our inner sense, procuring again from this infinite well of information. So that's another little uh, a little uh, tip that I would suggest. See if you can grab a friend who's also perhaps interested in dowsing, come up with some questions. And again, things that are just not that important. Uh, Did my friend's daughter get accepted into Harvard? That's kind of important. (laughs) But you know what I mean, keeping it kind of light. You ask the question, you come up with a question, ask your partner to pose the question. She's the one, he or she, with the pendulum you know the answer. Let's see if they pick it up. So I think that this is really powerful. And that's definitely another one that I'm really looking forward. We're going to do it again uh, for for all of y'all out there to try. Now, here's another. I have two more and then we're going to close it down. Let me look at the time here. I think we're doing okay. This is something that came to mind as I here we're talking about clairvoyance. Let me first clear clear this up. Clairvoyance, which essentially means clear seeing. We have clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, etc. In this case, I'm talking about sensing visually uh, things that are typically unseen. Spirit energy. Some people call them ghosts. All sorts of things that exist within this field, this spectrum that we typically can't see, but sometimes we do. When we do, where do we typically see it? Peripherally. Have you ever seen a light? You're looking straight ahead and you'll sense a little spark on one side of your face or another, or, you know, in the distance, peripherally in the moment you go to look, it's gone. I have, I'm sure you have too, or other things. So I thought to myself one day, I wonder if I were to practice seeing peripherally, would that help to strengthen my clairvoyance? Now, I can't say definitively that it it did or didn't, because I do typically see things peripherally. And in some, t- in some cases, I will see energy. I've seen orb-like uh, shapes uh, often, as a matter of fact, even right in front of me. Oftentimes we'll see them in images, but I have seen them on occasion right in front of me. Nonetheless, we know that somehow the peripheral vision can be stronger and can pick up a slightly larger spectrum of the visual of the visual field. And so what I thought to do is if I were to practice proactively seeing peripherally, that is what you would do. And I'll explain this. Pick a target that's right in front of you. Let's say it's an image in front of you, a, a, a painting. You stare at the painting, but or, or you're facing the painting. You're even looking at the painting. But at the same time, and I'm doing this as I speak with you, I'm actually looking at the computer monitor, but I see around me, I see a cabinet door. I see, and I'm trying not to look, But the bottom line is I'm seeing what I'm trying to do is stretch my peripheral vision as far back as I can. Let's see how far back you can go. How many things can you name within your peripheral view that you might not normally be paying attention to? I do feel that if we practice seeing peripherally, we'll be able to see farther and farther and farther back. I I have to bring this up briefly. I have talked to individuals who have been in, oh, let's say uh, transformational states and in heightened spiritual states, altered states that have said to me, I have been able to see on occasion 360 degrees. People that have had near death experiences or out of body experiences have reported on occasion being able to see 360, even if just for a brief moment. So what is that all about? 
can we actually become more clairvoyant by strengthening our peripheral vision? So that's something that I would suggest. Try that. See what, you know, there's lots of stuff going on out there right here that we, for whatever reason, our senses have, be- again, become atrophied and have are not picking up. But I do believe we can take them out of dormancy and do these things to help strengthen. So again, to recap on the peripheral strengthener, look, pick a target right in front of you. And as you're looking at the target at the same time, see if you can peripherally see more and more and more and and try to stretch, go back as far as you can. Practice that for a few minutes each day and see if uh, as you do that, you start to pick up more, uh, let's just say, energetic uh, um, presence of other kinds in in your environment. Okay, so that's that. <laughs> that's kind of a fun one. Here's another that I'm going to borrow and kind of take a, a kind of a hybrid of, let's just say. Again, going back to this great conversation that I had with a, a Australian broadcaster, uh, Barry Eaton, a, a couple of weeks ago when I was on his show. He talked about something we're going to call the fist squeeze the fist squeeze. He said, what had happened was I had forgotten something or I can't remember if it was me or he was just telling me about something that he oh, I know, he was being interviewed for a magazine recently. And had forgotten the name of somebody that he was he was citing, uh, perhaps quoting. And the interviewer of uh, at the magazine said, Barry, squeeze your left fist as tight as you can, and then let go. And you'll be able to recall the name of the person. Sure enough, he f- squeezed his fist, let go, popped right in. So <laughs> I, I, I was anxious to forget something so I could try it. Well, lo and behold, I did at, on the interview <laughs> as, as I was being uh, recorded for the interview. He said, all right, let's squeeze that fist. I squeezed my left fist. I, I was trying to recall what it was. I'm going to try to recall right now. Oh, I remember. <laughs> I'm not going to get into it. Bottom line is I squeezed my left fist for about five seconds. It took maybe a second or two for it to come in, but boom, came right in. I recalled what I had forgotten. So what's going on there when you're squeezing your left fist? Why is that happening? Well, many of us know the left side of the body is what accesses or even operates or is connected to the right side of the brain right side being the uh, less practical, more intuitive, more receptive, more creative, more imaginary part of us. So what I'm going to propose is not just for recalling information, but if we were to practice squeezing our fist, I'm doing it right now, say mm, 10, 15 seconds at a time, You're not necessarily trying to recall anything. What you're trying to do is massage the right brain so that you are really welcoming it into your lives more so that you can use it more. Barry also told me that uh, something that he had recently read said that we typically use our right brain only about 5% on average of the time. That means 95% of the time that pesky left brain is in control. Do we need that? (laughs) think so. At a minimum, I think it needs to be 50-50. But I would try the fist squeeze. I'm going to work on it. You try it, guys. Try it out, journeyers, and let me know what you think. I think this could help. So I would say 5, 10, maybe 15 seconds, then let go and go about your business. Don't try to. And here's the other thing. I think we try so often, we try too hard. Okay, I need to get some psychic information. Oh, I need an answer to this. There's an urgency. And I think we need to sort of relent on that and just kind of let it be. What we're trying to do is strengthen the muscle. Just like when you go to the gym and you're trying to strengthen those arms and you're working out the arms and the legs and the abs, you and then you you go home and you look in the mirror and say, oh, I don't see anything. No, you don't do that, of course not. You just keep working at it. So I think if we keep working at it, continue to go about our daily business, we may just see some some psychic breakthroughs uh, on our on our own in our own lives. 
kind of neat. So let's recap. This is kind of fun. So there's some stuff I so want you to try and let me know how they work for you. Again, we talked about sensing the planetary positions just by feeling into them. Using a combination of mental imagery to strengthen, a combination of mental imagery and visual images to strengthen your ESP. Spontaneous messaging. Are you able to bring anything through, not just for someone else, but for you? Perhaps you could ask a question, whatever that question may be, and ask for an answer and see at any time if something spontaneously comes through for you. Try that. The dowsing experiment, you'll need somebody else to do this with, but I think that would be really, really fun to do. Coming up with a series of questions and then having the other person, you know the answers, have the other person uh, see if they can procure the correct movement of the pendulum. The peripheral, per, there's a tongue twister, peripheral strengthener to help strengthen your clairvoyance. And then finally, the fist squeeze. I cannot say it enough, everyone. We have the tools built in, but you can't use, how, can, how, how would I like to end this? You have a hammer and you got a nail, but the nail is not going to be nailed into the wall until you pick up the hammer and start using it. The tool, you got to use the tool. You got to do it. You got to do it all the time. You've got to practice. You've got to practice and awaken and strengthen. So next time there's a psychic that's available for you that wants to do a reading, you don't have to go running to that psychic. Try to strengthen your own psychic ability. Why don't you? (laughs) I really do think it's all within. So there you have it. The other thing is, again, keep in mind, we are human antennas. We are much more than that. But we have the ability not only to receive, but to send. Maybe we'll talk about that next time. We are inextricably linked to this field of all. How exciting. If we make the effort to tap that field, imagine the possibilities. They're never ending. So there you go. Okay, I'm going to wind this up. Listen, very quickly. I am so excited. Guess who we're going to have on the show next week? Ever heard of Emery Smith? Emery Smith. You may have heard of him uh, from Gaia. He is uh, tearing up Gaia these days. Emery has a very, very, very multi-dimensional history, uh, both in government um, projects. He has worked on um, some very, very high-level um, projects having to do with free energy, etc. His bio is miles long, and he's only, I believe, in his late forties. But he has—I'm sure you've heard the name Emery Smith. Emery's going to be speaking at the Contact in the Desert coming up uh, at the end of May, and we're going to be doing some special featured uh, speaker interviews, like we did with Conscious Life Expo. Emery's one of the speakers, and so we're going to have him on next week. I am so excited to talk to Emery. He's got so much to share, and I really do feel that he. Uh, is here to impart what he knows with all of us for the good of mankind. That's the most important thing. So we're going to talk to Emery next week. Again, contact in the desert. Go there, why don't you? May 31st through June 3rd at the Renaissance Indian Wells Resort and Spa uh, in Indian Wells, California. I will be there. I will be there. This will be my third year covering it. I'm looking forward to it. With my buddies, Linda Moulton Howe, Graham Hancock, uh, Mary Rodwell is going to be coming from Australia. I'll be with Mary and a couple of the folks from the free organization. Jacques Vallée, Michael Tallinger. Oh my God, there are so many. Richard Dolan, you know, the, the, the big guys, the big guns are coming out <laughs> for this. Go to contactinthedesert.com. You can get the full list there. And I believe they're still, they still may be adding a few speakers, but it's all of that and more. I love this event. So, uh, again, Emery Smith next week, Contact in the Desert coming up. We will have several more interviews um, throughout the uh, between now and May 31st featuring speakers from Contact in the Desert. All right, guys, I know I'm over time, so I'm going to let you go. Go and pa- practice your fist squeeze, your peripheral strengthening, your dowsing, 
And uh, let me know how you do, huh? (laughs) Always enjoy talking to you, journeyers. You take care. I'll talk to you soon. Once again, this is Higher Journeys and Conscious Commentary.